I'm very sorry that I don't know Czech language at all, so I will speak in English. My name is Zakhar Popovic. Yes, uh, I am a leftist, a member of Left Opposition Collective in Ukraine. Yes, we uh, publish a magazine, uh, the comments and uh, the website, Gasoline for. Uh, I have been uh, on Maidan, I had been on Maidan uh, Square from the very beginning of these protests in, in just a year ago, yes, in the end of November. And uh, to the very end actually of this protest, protest of Maidan Square. I had been there actually with my red banner. Uh, I put uh, 12 uh, yellow stars on it to, uh, to make it clear that I'm not for, for bourgeois Europe but, but for, for some kind of socialist Europe. Yes, and uh, probably why I am introduced here because well, I, I am also kind of academic, I have a PhD in economics and I have some articles on actually economical development of Ukraine, economical growth and now we are trying to research the possible, uh, possible results of implementation of free trade agreement in uh, Ukraine. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start actually my presentation. Yes, and please, uh, I think it would be better to interrupt me if you think that some things are not interested or some things are unclear. <laughs> I will be grateful. Yes. yes, the first point I want to make is about the background of this Maidan and, and anti-Maidan uh, protests in Ukraine. Uh, so, you should understand that um, Ukraine appeared to be one of the poorest countries of the European continent. It was not that poor 20 years ago. 20 years ago, well, approximately 25, in 1991, 1990, the index of human development in Ukraine was a little bit higher than uh, in neighbor countries. In Romania, Belarus, Poland, for example, yes, the GDP per capita was a little bit higher. The structure of economy was much more like the structure of German or French economy. Because a very big machine building, probably in Czech Republic, the machine building is even much more developed. But, well, it was a huge amount of machine building in Ukraine in the structure of uh, industry, machine building uh, has approximately 30% and uh, only 10% was the mining and metallurgy. And in this 20 years the structure changed, made this reverse and now we have approximately 10 to 9%, now probably now, now even less, 9% uh, in machine building and more than 30% in uh, iron ore and coal mining and metallurgy. Mostly it's iron ore mining and metallurgy which is one of the main exports of Ukraine. Uh, so we became the producer of raw materials mostly. It's iron ore, uh, iron, it's some agricultural products and uh, also some simple chemistry products and so on, and machine building is mostly all in Ukraine. Uh, yes. Of course, it's no point to, to compare who's tough more, yes, who, uh, but uh, yes, situation was uh, quite bad in social conditions, and it was reflected in, uh, in mood of the people, yes. Uh, distrust in government, distrust in state was very, very huge significant. Most of population did not trust government and did not trust state in Ukraine. 
which was, which was quite different from most of the neighbor countries. Uh, in Russia, most of people trust Putin in some way. Yes. In probably Czech Republic, many people trust government and state in some way. But not in Ukraine. Actually, we were quite surprised in the year 2012, for example, for example yes, on how the state actually exists in such uh, disbelief among the people. But, but, uh, as actually Kagarlitsky put it, yes, if you know this Russian author, who is now very time I doubt, but uh, he put one interesting point, this, that the idea of Euro integration, of this way to Europe, was used systematically to legitimize all this collapse of industry and all these transformations and not only in Ukraine yes. so this idea of Europe as a big good and the future heaven where are we going and uh, should sacrifice all this uh, starvation of the people because that's because this idea was quite important for people Yes, and now about the nature of Maidan protests. Uh, yes, I think that uh, yes, the conflict was clearly inspired by some oligarchic opposition to Yanukovych. Uh, because this Yanukovych was too greedy and they just wanted to change him for some other, uh, other figure probably. And uh, the main logic, yes, the main, uh, the main motivation of people, of course, was not the Europe and your integration, and not a free trade zone with Europe. It is true that on the first stage, this slogan was very significant, and this slogan was probably the, uh, you can notice it uh, much, but. Uh, I think that the more important was the motivation of justice, yes. Uh, government promised Europe, government promised uh, the association with Europe. Actually, most of people did not know exactly what it means, but it means something to make us closer to Europe. Yes. And uh, this government betrayed this big promise of Europe, of this general good. And people were angry with this government. And uh, all far the logic of escalation of violence uh, was actually built on this logic of injustice, yes, of unjust behavior of government. Uh, yes, it is true that at the first stages Maidan was non-violent protest. But yes, it was a non-violent protest to provocate some violence from the state and police. And uh, yes, actually this violence was provocated. Yes, it was uh, several steps. The first steps was, well, unclear provocation made probably by both sides, by some radicals of National radical nationalists and some some people inside the Yanukovych government when it was uh, the uh, kids were beaten. Yes, the students on Maidan Square was really heavily beaten and uh, many people was very angry with this unjust behavior to the students because yes, mostly the protest was not violent. And the next step was actually the introduction of these emergency laws by the government. And uh, these emergency laws declared all the, all the participants of Maidan the criminals. And people became also very angry with this government. Because really most of the people at that time was against any kind of violent, uh, violent uh, actions. And, but after that violence escalated. And, and yes, after that point, uh, some uh, 
some ammunition appeared on my down, some guns and so on. And uh, the last the last stage was the storm of my town, yes, the attack uh, by riot police to my town, which really uh, makes the square a, a, a battlefield and uh, some, as you know, approximately hundred of, of uh, people were, were killed. And I don't know who is uh, the major, who is guilty, actually. It is not clear. Probably uh, the most of people were killed by the state riot police, but it was also some shooting from the side of protesters, which is also obvious. Yes, but it was a social story, and as, as you know, the result of Maidan was, was not there actually the your integration yes it was not uh, even the um, it was the uh, agreement uh, of association without the free trade zone without the economic part uh, which was actually the point before my time so in this <laughs> it is it is um, well, very interesting that this agenda uh, to sign the agreement a little bit later was actually proposed by Yanukovych before my time. Yes. And this idea of science agreement um, with, uh, without the economical part, to postpone the economical part, was actually the, the idea before my time. And after this you are my time, actually the same decision was taken uh, by a new government <laughs> in other circumstances. So. Well, other very important uh, point for me and I think for all people who are left, left liberal, is the presence of right wingers and radical nationalists on my own. And of course, of course they have a significant presence there. And, and of course one of the very sad and uh, but very important outcomes of Maidan is uh, the legitimation of this radical nationalist ideology in society. Uh, before my time, most of radical uh, nationalist groups were not considered as some kind of legal political force. They were marginal, most of society just exclude them. But after my time, it happens that for very, very many people, they became acceptable. So their kind of authority in society, recognition in society, increased much, which is very dangerous. Yes, and it is also true that radical right-wingers mostly succeeded to prevent some very weak attempts of fragmented democratic left to build a strong left wing on my own. But, uh, also, we can see the result. Uh, I will actually cite uh, Volodymyr Ishenka, who is a Ukrainian social sociologist who, uh, who researched, uh, studied very much the Maidan and the presence of far right there and the protests in Ukraine. Uh, he's very skeptical about Maidan, but uh, he said that Svoboda, it's a right wing party in Ukraine, and right sector lost their opportunity to become true vanguards of Maidan and failed to convert their high presence in the, to the strong positions in power. So, yes, Maidan was dominated by right wingers, but it was not managed and uh, absolutely out of the control of uh, some radical nationalists. Yes, and from other hand, uh, I want to point out that Maidan was also important as a, uh, as a some experience of emancipatory politics. And it is true also, the, it is a contradictory nature of this Maidan. Uh, 
Yes, the first point I want um, made, I borrow it from Russian sociologist Juravlov, who made um, uh, many interviews on Maidan and anti Maidan, and uh, researched this uh, protests, studied this protest, sorry. And uh, uh, he came to decision that actually Maidan developed as a kind of Ukrainian nationalism. Not ethnic one, but some kind of civil citizen uh, nationalism. Uh, with no regard to language, ethnic origin and, and some other things. And it was very, very inclusive, yes. Uh, for Maidan people, for people on this Maidan square, for protesters, Everybody who came from Donetsk, Lugansk, from Russia to support Maidan was very welcomed. And they, they really feel like they, are, they represent all the nation, all the liberation tendencies of all the Ukrainian nation, uh, with every language speaking, with every ethnic background and cultural background and so on. Uh, other point that uh, because of that uh, inclusive character, uh, the people of Maidan uh, could not recognize anybody who is against this general will of Maidan as a real Ukrainian, yes, and it turned to be exclusive. <laughs> yes, and more my own experience, it was very different from the mass protests of the year 2004, when it was the Orange Revolution at Maidan, Orange Maidan in Kiev. Uh, Orange Maidan was actually silent. It was only one stage with uh, only one slogan, Yushchenko Tak. Yes, yeah, Yushchenko, yes, Yushchenko. And, uh, mm, absolutely no different point of views were uh, present. And uh, on this Maidan, on these uh, protests, uh, we see the opposite picture. It was, it was loud revolution. Uh, it was very diverse. There were very many different stages and rooms where you can see very different discussions. Yes, the main stage was mostly controlled by these leaders of opposition parties, three main opposition parties. But just 50 meters from it, it was an open university stage. And it was very diverse. Many leftists speak there. Well, I actually had the opportunity to speak there about the Jean Zen protests and the solidarity with workers in Kazakhstan and some kind of left agenda from Maidan. It was also open microphone stage on the Hrishatik street where yeah, many people speak and many people listen to them. When uh, the big building of Ukrainian house was occupied by protesters, it was uh, as a discussion club organized mostly by leftists, students assembly, and um, we had discussions and uh, well, lectures on economic situation in Ukraine and so on, and also I, I gave a lecture there, and I was surprised to what extent uh, the agenda of social justice um, was at first uh, point for people. So, it was very few of, of radical nationalist agenda and very many uh, questions about the oligarchs, about the social justice and so on. And actually, we, we had a presentation of our leftist journal there, probably 300 of people participated, just inside, yes, in my town. And I openly declared myself a communist, and nobody eat it in action. Uh, yes. 
And uh, yes, one other example is uh, occupation of a Minister of Ed Education uh, just after Yurikovich went away. Uh, the students occupied the building of Ministry of Education and they did not allow members of uh, right-wing, radical right-wing parties, the Svoboda and Twice sector, to enter. It was uh, one attempt, but they have some student self-defense unit and uh, they have this fire guidance, yes, too, which is a very good thing to protect the building from entering. And, uh, well, probably uh, the right-wingers had some other important things to do, but they did not decide to take it by force. And this student assembly in this Ministry of uh, Education um, developed some list of uh, demands to the new minister. And the new minister was forced to speak to this assembly two or three times, discussing these demands, and finally he was allowed by students to go inside uh, only after he signed this agreement, uh, plan to be... There was the, the plan of decisions uh, he, he, should, he should make and measures. One of them was uh, uh, responsibility to publish all the account of the information of the ministry uh, and it was really uh, introduced and now on the, on the website of the Ministry of Education you can see uh, daily these files with all the transactions of accountants of this ministry, which is probably good. But uh, this guy, uh, he is not a member of some radical right-wing party. He's not a member of Svoboda party. But he's a right-winger. And um, uh, he has some background in right-wing organizations. And probably the Svoboda party pushed him. And uh, probably it's a Svoboda party quota, uh, quota uh, for ministry helped him to, to enter this position. And uh, now some of steps uh, that this guy is doing uh, looks like very bad. Uh, for, for example, he declared that the teachers in schools in the East who were involved in organizing of referendum for independence of Donetsk region should be uh, fired, dismissed from, uh, from the jobs. And uh, even by Ukrainian law, it's strange, yes, because if if these people are kind of some criminal separatists and so on, it's not the um, it's not the Ministry of Education who should decide it. Yeah. Mm, yeah. But. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we can yes, we can speak about some emancipatory tendencies on Maidan. There were also some attempts to introduce some direct democracy, to introduce some new uh, electronic democracy ideas, and so on by some uh, point, uh, groups of intelligence. But mostly, they did not uh, really succeed. And. Uh, Mostly the self-organization of this uh, Maidan was on picnic level yes, and the uh, vertical institutions and structures dominated. And the left on Maidan was present but they were fragmented. Very fragmented with no uh, general uh, agenda, united agenda. Uh, if we speak about some democratic left and if we, if we speak about the traditional left, they show, that, for example, Communist Party of Ukraine or Socialist Party of Ukraine, uh, they um, appear to be ignorant, uh, often using some kind of Pensilovic, Shalinist rhetoric, 
and uh, made the cell easy target to declare themselves just Russian agents and so on. Yes, and the major mistake of, of, the, of all the left is Ukraine. In Ukraine is uh, absolute inability yes, to promote kind of agenda of focused solidarity among the Maidan and the entire Maidan. And the major the major mass mobilization of Maidanists and the entire Maidan was, was not kind of ultra nazis and was not controllable by right wing nationalists. And it was mostly of low classes of society, of these working people presence, with independent union presence. But left uh, allowed to trap themselves in this situation to support only Maidan and Thai Maidan. Very, very few uh, tried to, to make links. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> How much time I have? I mean, you have? You have time? Okay, thank you. Yes, about new criminal governments, yes. And, uh, Just two days ago, I was in Kiev on presentation of one film about Maidan, made by um, Radinsky, Ukrainian director, and uh, he was uh, he was very pro Maidan person. He loved Maidan very much. Yes, but um, uh, he said that we have new new criminal government. Yes, the one of the slogans of Maidan was to dismiss uh, this criminal government, but we changed for other government who is guilty uh, in uh, actually blowing up this war in Ukraine. He said that he's not sure, is it guilty, uh, is, is it guilty in some kind of conscious crime, or it was just uh, uh, criminal uh, obstance of, of any action. But it was absolutely clear that this government could make very much steps to prevent this situation. Uh, yes. Uh, the, the one moment, yes. Then, this government actually was uh, legitimized in Parliament. You, you can hardly... Uh, yes, in, in my town, very many people uh, feel themselves as, as kind of sovereign, as a kind of general view of the people and feel themselves empowered to install some kind of new government. So, but it not happened. Uh, the leaders of Maidan organized uh, the voting in parliament and uh, actually the parliament uh, appointed this new government and it, it is absolutely legitimate in the sense of, of uh, Ukrainian state and so on. Probably some kind of procedures could be uh, violated but, but very, very few and uh, you should understand that in Ukrainian parliament history Every time after each change of government, some uh, some points in, in law changed in some way. When Yushchenko came to power, it was also a political decision to uh, vote a new law in Rada to to uh, legitimize uh, the action and uh, refused to recognize this government. Could meet only kind of recognition of Yanukovych as acting president who was out of the country and uh, which, which was probably not acceptable even for people on the east. And oh, other thing is to call for kind of immediate uprising against this government. And yes, Russian right-wingers in the east, yes, begin the kind of uprising against this government. And uh, I think that Probably the major factor of uh, escalating of this civil war, of course, is the Russian presence and Russian influence. 
but uh, it is absolutely clear that uh, Ukrainian government did many steps uh, to escalate the situation. The first of all is a language law. Yes, the language law uh, in Ukraine. Yes, we in 1991 uh, was introduced a language law, which yes, in Leninist tradition. Uh, uh, pose uh, some privileges to Ukrainian language. Uh, yeah, so it was uh, probably the Lenin, uh, the Lenin point from the state and revolution that to um, achieve real equality, we should sometimes impose some kind of uh, uh, formal inequality. Yes. So it was a uh, kind of uh, special privileges for Ukrainian language and it was uh, acting for, for, for approximately 20 years and several years before uh, Yanukovych the government introduced a new law, new language law uh, which is much more democratic in Europe. It makes uh, much more possibility for regional languages and, and so on. And this law is still acting in Ukraine, this more democratic law. But just after the revolution, after this Maidan, yes, after the, uh, the appointment of new government, uh, the right-wingers uh, in, uh, introduced in parliament and forced the, voted, parliament voted for this uh, old law. Yes which is uh, uh, quite not, not, not that democratic and make privileges for Ukraine government. It was not, it was never signed. But it was very important for people in the East to see the tendencies, the declarations that they want to. It was withdrawn, it was not signed. But this step was really uh, escalating the hostage, hostages from, um, from the East. And uh, also, they mm, could prevent uh, some smashing of Lenin monuments all over the country, mm -hmm. but they did not. They uh, even uh, probably inspired uh, the Ministry of Interior. It looks like they inspired some um, attacks and um, for example, the destruction of Lenin Monument in Kharkiv was made with clear support from the police. And they could do not move troops inside populated areas immediately. And they, they probably could not rely on these right wingers of right sector and other to. To yes, to decide their problems, but they did, and um, of course, the very big part of responsibility for this civil war is on, on this government. Yes, now I can speak about the nature of Donetsk People's Republic and Lugansk People's Republic. Yes. Uh, I don't think that uh, it was a mass popular uprising in Donetsk, for example. Uh, I visited Donetsk personally and I visited Slavyansk, Matovsk personally and uh, I'm in contact with people who live there and uh, academics who try to research it. I also have contacts and uh, trying to communicate with the members actually of People's Council of Donetsk People's Republic. And uh, from my opinion, uh, it was not that mass mobilization. And uh, the, uh, big, the biggest demonstrations uh, in Donetsk 
against the Ukrainian government. The biggest anti-Maidan demonstration was was approximately of the same size, size as pro-Maidan demonstration in Donetsk. And <clears throat> before this event, it would be very hard to uh, to say if the majority of population of Donetsk uh, really, the Donetsk region really wanted to uh, to separate from Ukraine or was really anti-Maidan. So. It was uh, mostly reactionary motivation, actually. Um, when uh, when um, Zhurovlov uh, interviewed uh, participants of anti Maidan protests, uh, the motivation of um, keeping the order against the kind of uh, disorder, kind of revolution which brings disorder, was very, very important for, for people of anti-Maidan protests. And it was very exclusive, actually. Uh, if on Maidan people from Donetsk were welcomed mostly, people from Kiev were very unwelcome. Uh, as soon as uh, people realized that I am from Kiev, nobody speaks to me and in Slovyansk they actually wanted to put me in prison and only because there were some local guys from Slovyansk who said that I am not pro Maidan and <laughs> not, not against them so I was released but some guys were for example one art director from Donetsk was imprisoned in Slavyansk a day before I visited Slavyansk and uh, was in prison for three months, I think. Only because he just uh, made ag agitation <laughs> in, 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 in some uh, cafe shop against the uh, Donetsk People Republic and in favor of Maidan. Yes, but. Um, And, um, but of course, uh, step by step, it will uh, support of uh, probably the majority of local population. And uh, this support was won because this uh, inadequate, uh, hostile actions of central government. And um, it is also inter interesting that, um, to some extent, the entire Maidan movement uh, was... Okay, I'm just... I have five minutes, so... Uh, entire Maidan movement was developing as kind of mirror of uh, Maidan movement. Um, not really a, mir a real mirror, but a mirror of image of Maidan movement in uh, mostly Russian media. And if, if you will see the, if you will read the Declaration of Independence of Donetsk People Republic, uh, it is very good. <laughs> and uh, it declares its sovereignty as uh, not from kind of legitimation of, of some previous state institutions, but directly from a prizing of the people, directly from the sovereignty of the people to decide uh, what to do and uh, in what country to live. It's a very good document and uh, unfortunately there were no basement for this good document and uh, I could cite uh, the member of the... Uh, Alexander Smikali, the member of um, the People's Council of Donetsk People's Republic. Who, who write that except of these points in declaration of you know, Donetsk People Republic, nothing, absolutely nothing was did really to establish some kind of 
popular sovereignty and uh, democracy and uh, social justice in the uh, Donetsk Republic. Yes, uh, the last point I want to address is actually the results of elections. Yes, now we have uh, elections both in Ukraine, yes, and in this so-called self-proclaimed Donetsk People Republic. Yes. And yeah, we can see that uh, Ukraine uh, in 100 years is moving west just as Poland did after the World War II, and now Ukraine is moving west on the map. But uh, right-wingers uh, right -wingers are moving east in Ukraine. And uh, it is interest for me, the most important result of election is uh, the decrease of electoral support for radical right wingers in West regions of Ukraine. And we even have kind of, no, if, if to speak generally, yes, the level of support of right wing parties in Ukraine remain on quite low level. The Svoboda party, which was in parliament previous time, now did not enter parliament. It, it is openly right wing radical party. The right sector party receives approximately one and a half percent of public vote. And this is in situation uh, where the big part of of, uh, of Ukraine was a part was not voting. Yes, Donetsk, uh, Lugansk, and Crimea always voted against the war, against right, uh, and if this, uh, these parts were together, probably the public support of, for, for this right wing is a little bit, uh, uh, should be even, even less. But the support for these right wing parties in central Ukraine increased dramatically in Kiev and in some central regions. But in uh, western regions, Five years ago, Svoboda received 30% of vote, 30% of vote on mm, uh, local elections in Lviv region, Ivan Frankovsk region, and uh, Ternopil region. Now they received around 10% in these regions. So the support for this party uh, decreased dramatically in these regions, but it increased dramatically in Kiev. And, of course, it's an absolute failure for, for left. Uh, no left party at all entered the parliament. Uh, the, uh, the, the, year ago, the year ago, just before Maidan, the support for Communist Party and for Svoboda Party was growing. But now both of these parties just are out of the parliament. And uh, support for Communist Party decreased much more dramatically than, uh, than support for than vote for Svoboda. And um, most of the parliament are kind of right wingers and uh, sometimes quite radical right wingers, of course. But but not that ideological, not that ethnical nationalists as Svoboda Party in the right sector, for example. Uh, for example, right populist uh, Leshko Party. But most of the vote is for moderate nationalist, national democrats. Yes. Well, I have. Very uh, and uh, elections in Donetsk People Republic, yes? Uh, the only point I think that uh, was shown by these elections is that most of the population uh, supported this regime of 
Donetsk people in power. They, uh, I don't think that it was really a kind of choice. It was a choice between two uh, lists which were closed. So you should uh, the only first three names of the um, list was public, and you nobody knows other names in this list. Just after elections, they will decide who they will uh, include in one or other list. <laughs> but really, many people came to these elections and voted, and most of them voted for their acting leaders of this uh, of this state. I don't know. Is it really a state? What what is it? But for. So leaders of so-called people of public. So the fact is that most of the population there supported uh, this government and supported, did not want to withdraw this government, uh, did not want to join Ukraine or, or something like that. And this is the situation, yes. And, uh, So my conclusion that uh, Ukraine as a country is divided and we can hardly expect, predict any kind of easy reunification in the nearest future. And we should look forward to, as a leftist, yes, as a people who are interested in some democracy and social justice, look forward to how to build the Walker's solidarity among uh, the people and uh, the walkers in, in both sides of Ukraine. And uh, we should not blame whose junta is worse and who is more fascist and who has more right wingers in government uh, or less. I think that both regimes has nothing to do with um, with liberation with emancipation and with development of grassroots uh, workers